I've been I've been accused this morning of hyperbole, of giving more credit to our speakers than they deserve. But I, I beg to differ with them. Uh, and, and so will be with with uh, Catherine Rennie, who uh, has done nothing short. I'm, for someone like myself, who has been very at home in say the mid three or four decades of the 18th century, uh, Catherine has indulged in temporal and spatial expansion of 3,000 years. So Catherine is, is really going, uh, going uh, way beyond what, what my uh, narrow confines are. Uh, Catherine Rennie was educated at the University of California, Berkeley, and practiced as an architect and urban designer for 10 years before turning her attention to urban history, where her focus has been the history of Rome's water supply as it relates to urban development. She is project director for an ongoing web-based research project called Aqua Rome, Urbis Roma, the waters of the city of Rome, <coughs> that is published by the University of Virginia. The project, as I said, examines the 3,000-year history of water infrastructure and urban development in Rome through GIS mapping. Catherine has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Fulbright Commission, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of this work. Her manuscript, The Waters of Rome, Aqueducts, Fountains, and the Birth of the Baroque City will be available in January 2011 from Yale University Press. Her work, then, combines architectural history, history, archaeology, and natural history. I, I really, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to be taking the wind out of your sails, Catherine, but I love the, the alternate title for her website, which uh, she told me was Walking on Water in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Please help me welcome Catherine. for this wonderful conference and for inviting me. Um, I would also like to especially thank um, Vincent Buonanno, who is the, um, his role is the Chief Visual Procurement Officer, <laughs> as he described his role to me. And I would especially like to thank him because uh, almost all of the images you'll see in my presentation come from his collection, which he generously allowed me to work with. So I'm going to be talking about a different aspect of this um, task of describing the 18th century city, the mid-18th century city of Rome. So my, the work that I'll be talking about um, complements the work of Bernardini, Vasi, uh, Piranese, and Noli, but in a very different way, uh, in that I'll be talking about the Tiber River. I'm one of those people with really bad eyesight. Um, is that why you were holding your paper like this? Yes. Yeah, okay. Bummer. Um, oh, wait, is this a light? Is that a light? Never mind, I got it. It's a light. Okay, can you hear me? No. 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 Oh. Just push it down. Bring it closer. Oh, up higher. Up more. Now, can you hear me? Better. Yeah, you just yeah. want to closer. Okay. All right. Um, put my glasses back on. In 1701, during his trip to Rome, the English essayist Joseph Addison lamented that the Tiber River was impoverished and, quote, destitute of strength. To him, it had lost its status as the river most sacred to heaven and its central symbolic position in Rome's foundation mythology. He was not the first person to grieve for the once proud Tiber. In 1568, Pope Pius V bemoaned the sense of abandonment that gripped all of Rome, but in particular, he singled out the Tiber River. He called it a veritable purgatory 
a purgatory that flowed through the heart of the city, both an actual sewer purgatory <laughs> and a symbol of a city that had fallen from grace. The main, the main trade artery for Rome, the Tiber had been an open drain for centuries, a convenient disposal site for trash, garbage, and the occasional dead body, as Cicero had pointed out centuries earlier. In spite of a growing number of public uh, announcements, editi, that forbid its use as a sewer, conditions at the Tiber were still deplorable in the mid-18th century, where our story begins. How had this happened, and what did it mean for Rome? The quantity of material that fell into or was dumped into the Tiber since antiquity is impossible to estimate. And much of it was too heavy to be pushed by the current into the sea. Private individuals received licenses, uh, uh, reserved licenses to scavenge for metal and stone at the various river gates, along the river banks, and at the points where the drains and sewers emptied into the river. And I show you here in this very well-known uh, Piranese print, what most people don't know is right here is uh, a group of cercatori, people who are licensed to paw through all this effluent that's coming directly from a sewer drain. And their job is to search for, um, for funds. Yet, um, okay. Bronze and marble statues, building materials, and rubble remained sunk into the riverbed for centuries. Fishermen often found these treasures <coughs> by accident, and the Camera Apostolica, the administrative body that handled papal finances, authorized dredging and scavenging, such as you see here, with the specific goal of recovering statuary and inscriptions. Although regulations called for pulling everything out of the river, regardless of its value, and to remove sandbanks, walls, palisades, fishing platforms, weirs, and staircases that led to mills, uh, as you see back in this image, we see the mill and the various impediments. Um, in spite of all those uh, restrictions, the thoroughness of this kind of clean river remained a dream. Some objects lay submerged for a millennium. The quantity of gold coins, jewelry, inscriptions, sculptural fragments, and entire sculpture, uh, broken friezes, lamps, and keys, not to mention junk, dating from the prehistoric period to the 19th century was staggering. An entire triumphal arch that originally decorated the approach from the Campus Marzio, from the Campo Marzio, to an ancient bridge known as the Pons Antonianus, which will later be called the Pons Triumphale, which I'll show you in prints. Um, uh, this ancient bridge was found in the riverbanks in 1878 during construction of the Tiber embankment. The bridge had collapsed during the flood of 799. 1,100 years earlier, and its accompanying inscription on this portal, although shattered in several pieces, was found with its text running in the proper order from slab to slab to slab. It simply all in like that into the river. And so here are a few of the finds from um, this one excavation that took place in 1878. So as garbage, trash, marble chips, and construction debris continued to accumulate in the river, the, river, the bed of the river rose and it widened. So it's, it's become even bigger as it becomes filled with debris. And with the ceaseless slap of the waves against the buildings, the foundations were being undermined. But at the same time, all the debris that's flowing in the river would collect at its edges because the center of the river flows faster than the banks, and that's another reason why there's so much trash there. Another reason that the river was so filthy and treacherous was because Rome's many industries and ports were located along its banks. I show here the Ripa Grande. 
The Tiber was the economic lifeblood of the city in the mid 18th century, and it was clogged like, like a transit hub at uh, rush hour, essentially, um, with stevedores who were loading and unloading goods from ships, boats, and ferries. In the 17th century, it had become necessary to limit, and this continued into the 18th and 19th century, uh, it had become necessary to limit the number of ships waiting in line to embark at the Ripa Grande the, to six. There could only be six waiting in line uh, because this was the most important port of the river and all of those extra ships waiting to unload were clogging the river and causing damage to the port as well as to themselves. So along with the stevedores who were working at the river, there were also tanners, candle makers, cat gut processors who were making strings for musical instruments, millers, fishermen, ferrymen, water sellers, ceramicists, laundry, laundresses, scavengers, and trash collectors, all working at the water's edge. They all complained about the mess and about the impediments within the river that interfered with their work. But none of them <laughs> uh, did much to regulate themselves, even though they published regulations, they never really followed them, for the most part. For example, the Millers. Uh, they complained most vociferously and most bitterly about the debris in the river because the debris began to narrow the, um, uh, uh, the banks, as I, narrow the river, as I said. I mean, it widened the river, but it makes the navigable part narrower. Um, even though they complained the most bitterly about this, they, in fact, through their very own work, also contributed in a major way to the impediments because the mills floated in the river and narrowed the river themselves. And in addition, they built what are called palisades, uh, pasonate, which were pa fences underneath the <coughs> river that would direct the flow of water toward their mill. So there, there are underwater fences that you may or may, may not be able to see as your boat is going down the river. I think I, I'm sorry, here, uh, yes. And so you see a mill here. And uh, unfortunately, there's no pasanate. I didn't put the slide in. I'm sorry, I apologize. Nonetheless, their work was essential. As we all know, they ground the grain. So they were exceptionally vocal, and their, um, their complaints are registered um, in abundance in the ar archives of the city of Rome. In 1738, the owner of a floating mill known as the Mola di San Giuseppe a Ponte Rotto, and this is Ponte Rotto, the broken bridge, protested about the debris. He, through his argument, demonstrated that illegally dumped garbage in the area of his mill at Ponte Santa Maria, that is the broken bridge, created such an impediment to the river current that was needed to turn the mill wheel, that it was impossible for him to grind grain. He pointed out that this not only caused personal financial hardship, but it also hurt the poor people who lived nearby. And he's not specific about how it hurts them. He just says that it does. Another document, this one undated, but from the same period, uh, records a petition signed by six millers all on the river, and one boat owner who protested that more than 500 cartloads of trash a day were thrown into the river. They observed that the debris caused damage to the mills and to the boat landings. Furthermore, the trash filled the riverbed to such an extent that the millers were forced to raise the level of their paddle wheels. And this maneuver, which was very costly, meant that less of each of the blades would hit the water. It meant that the wheels would move more slowly and the mill wheel grinding the grain would move more slowly. So it's a very difficult situation for them to be, then, be in. And they pointed out that at one, at one point they could, they could grind two to three times more grain than they could at this moment in the mid-18th century. 